Welcome back to another video. It has been some time since I've done a vlog like this. It's been about three or four months or so. So I'm very excited to jump back on camera and share with you a trip to Liverpool over several days. We've got lots planned. I'm going to meet a previous guest who's going to show me around a HMO, then a mega mo. Then we're going to check in on a refurb and then uh, going over to record a podcast in Manchester. So a packed couple of days. And today there is a theme to the vlog and the theme is change because lots of change is happening right now in my business, lots of change in my personal life. So stay tuned because I've got lots to share with you. Oh, yeah, I've been wanting this forever. I've been in the field of whatever they throw at me, brush it off, pick myself up, moving on to the better. So we've just arrived in the Wirral on the other side of the river from obviously Liverpool city centre. And today we are here to meet Ollie and he's going to show us around his brand new HMO, which is just behind me, six bedrooms, six en suites. And I'm going to ask him about his views on mindset and property investing. Let's go. What I'm trying to do in this video is share a lot of change that's going on to myself and my business, the way that we've pivoted, but also change in the investor that you are, for example. So the question I want to ask you is, how do you think you've changed from a beginner investor to now? Like, are there certain beliefs, skills, attributes that you think you've had to adopt along the way? I think I would say it's a reduction in fear. There's always a lot of fear at the beginning. Again, it's because you haven't done it before. So even the process of like your first buy to let mortgage, your first little refurb, your first time you actually understand about damp and how it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the first time you get a cannabis, put, cannabis farm put in one of your houses, <laughs> all stuff like that. So it's just like getting past those things and experiencing them. And then every time it happens again, hopefully the weed farm won't happen again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. Every time it happens, it's just more of a, it, it becomes more of just a normal thing. It's just like problems come up. You don't worry about them too much. It's just a yeah. thing that needs to get fixed. You've fixed them a million times before. Yes. Um, so the fear comes down. In line with that, the propensity to take slightly higher risks goes up. Uh, in line with your confidence increasing as well. Yeah. Um, because when you've got your head around the, the very basic aspects of property investment and doing the single lets and that kind of stuff, and then you move on to the likes of this, it's just slowly heading that Going way. Up. And you sort of think, well, this is how anyone starts in their journey. No one starts by building a 20 story block of flats or a hundred story block of flats. Very, very rarely. It's never gonna happen, is it? I don't think I actually wanna get to a point where I'm building a 20 story, a <laughs> hundred story block of flats, to be perfectly honest. But guaranteed everyone who is doing that they started small somewhere smaller yeah. and then they got the experience and i think referring to what you said there is you kind of like each time you push that stress barrier up don't you and you get used to the feeling of that problem that stress and you understand yeah. it more don't you so absolutely and and i'm i'm a warrior so i worry about things yeah. and uh I have to do these things to get over that next level of worry. So you go through the sleepless nights and the taking out the development finance and then the project getting delayed and it's, oh my God, it's costing me 2,000 pounds a month or something like that. To get to a point where it still works out at the end and it's not the end of the world. And then when you do it again, it's just, it's all factored in um, and you just slowly level up each time. No, that's brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. And um, another one being around the deals, because I think a lot of people get stuck at the beginning with um, finding good deals, right? So when you look back on your portfolio, your deals and the, the, the properties you've bought, where are you finding them? Like, are they sitting on the market? Are they direct to vendor? Like, have you done both? Like, where's, where are your properties? At the start, when I started properly in Liverpool in 2017, everything was just on market. Yeah. And the, the way I got most of my deals was it was all in the follow-up. So it would be putting in embarrassingly low offers, yep. getting laughed at, and then following up until someone else has bought it or until it has fallen through and then you call the agent on that Friday afternoon at just the right time when it's just fallen through and you say, I'm still interested in buying this. I can save the chain or whatever if it has just fallen through. So that, that's the thing for me. It's having a system in place so that every Friday you're calling the agents about all your offers. Don't be embarrassed to put in an embarrassing offer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've got to feel uncomfortable um, almost, don't you? Do yeah, it. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, that, that's that's how I would go about it. That's how I still kind of go about it, to be honest. It's all in the follow-up. I think also, however, conversely to that is, like I said before, not waiting for that Nirvana deal. Yeah. If the right one, even if it's an average deal, comes along, but it hits your criteria, don't overthink it. And I've been there before, just yes. like doing the numbers, an analyzing, reanalyzing mm -hmm. everything 
uh, to the point where you get analysis paralysis. But again, that comes with experience. It does, yeah, so. it does. And I think that's a really good point because if it hits your numbers and it's fundamentally a good property, sometimes they get better with time and age anyway, don't yeah. they? So uh, no, two really good factors there. And I'm, I'm smiling because that's often what I tell anyone that I've sort of like mentored, uh, I've, I've often said to them like, these deals aren't just sitting on right move where you can sit at home and you can and go, oh, perfect BR, BRR deal. I'm just going to view it and put in the asking price. Like, you've just got to be active. You've got to be out there and you've got to follow up. And, and I'm so pleased. As you, you say, said volume. It's, it's, it's volume. It's all about volume. volume, isn't it? Yeah. So final, final question, and then I'll let you get on for the day. And that is, where's where's this going over the next five years for you? Okay, you're kind of, you're financially free, aren't you, in terms of you're doing this full time and you work for yourself, you have your portfolio. What's the goal and where are you going to take this over the next five years? For me, it's getting to a point, I, I still self-manage everything. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit of a control freak. <laughs> I worry about things. I struggle to let things go, uh, which has its benefits, but also has its setbacks. And it's probably limited me in terms of speed um, and being able to grow things more, but also uh, in terms of what I actually enjoy doing, because I enjoy finding the deals. I enjoy liaising with the contractors, all that kind of stuff. Where I want to get over the next couple of years will be to actually hire someone into my business to manage the letting side of things. Oh, brilliant. I've got to a point where I know exactly how I want my portfolio to be managed. Yeah. I don't think I want to hand it over to an agent. So I'd rather hire someone who's keen and wants to learn about property uh, and teach them how to do it the, the way that I've sort of naturally developed since I started doing it myself. So that will be a really big thing for me. And that will enable me to then keep doing this kind of stuff. Yes. Going out on viewings, finding the right properties, negotiating. But I think as well, it's always pushing it to the next level. So I want to, the next thing I want to do is a block of flats, maybe convert a house into a block of, a block of flats or something along those lines because I haven't done it before. Yep. So now it's like, when this is done, there'll be two HMOs in the portfolio. So I've kind of done it before, but again, then it's just every different property you go and view, it's another strategy that you can potentially do on that property if it's not just going to be a single buy to let. Yes. So you're, just... you're a problem solver, aren't you? Yeah. You like yeah. a challenge. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm really excited to hear you say that about hiring someone because you told me that like two years ago. Yeah. So it hasn't yeah. changed. Damn it, you're going to hold me to it now. No, it's great. <laughs> like, I think it's so great. Like you've had that focus and that idea and you've not wavered from that. You just kept buying properties and now you're getting to the point where that, that could come reality. That's like really the, exciting. The thing is though, like, and I do need to hold myself to it, is if I could look back to when I told you that two years ago, I got to the position where, you know, financially, I, I could have made that decision to hire someone by now, but I haven't done it. And again, that's because of the procrastination of like, oh, then I have to, train someone and I have to actually document everything that <laughs> yeah. I do and they're not going to do it as well as I can do it. And blah, yep. blah. Yep. But again, these are all just, I think, natural fears when you're growing a business that 100%. is yes. another thing to just get over. Yeah, I'm no expert by any means. I've made a lot of mistakes and, and had some successes. And when I hire, I have the fear of not having the control. I then have the fear of all the extra time you have to put into someone. You then kind of go through this period, this is what I found, with, uh, obviously hiring for a very different thing for people in the sourcing team. You have this period of maybe two or three months where things aren't getting done how you want them to. And then what either happens is that continues and you get rid of them or mm. suddenly you have kind of breakthroughs and they actually they start to really take time away from you. Yeah. They actually start doing things really well. And um, yeah, I'm excited for you to Or do even them. better than they start doing things their own way. Yes. That you didn't even think of and it's actually better than the way you do it. And then you're like, yes. That's genius. Bringing ideas to the table. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 100%. So, uh, yeah. No, I will, well, I will hold you to that because then I'll mention please, it in a future video. Please do. And I'll say, have you done Shame that Shame me in two <laughs> years when we're standing here and I haven't hired <laughs> <laughs> No, I just want to say thank you very much. You know, Pleasure. Appreciate your time as always. This is a fantastic project and, and thanks for sharing it on the channel. Everyone appreciates it. Absolutely. Anytime. Pleasure. Thanks, Ollie. Nice one. After visiting that first HMO, we then head over to Ollie's latest top secret property purchase, which is another HMO conversion, which we can't currently share any information on until Ollie gets further down the line. But I visited the project, took a look around with Ollie, filmed some content so that one day we can bring you a video in the future. So there's two things that I really wanted to, I guess, highlight for the video from seeing both your HMO projects today. One of them is that I think from what you said, it sounds really vital that someone actually reads through the policies for that specific area. And I've heard people say that before, but I didn't know whether to 
you know, whether they're just saying that to, you know, be a responsible HMO landlord, but actually it sounds like you do need to get into the nitty gritty of the policies. 100%, because it helps when you're doing viewings as well anyway, if you know the things to look out for, where you're like, okay, that's going to fall short of that policy, you'll know what will be, might be difficult. Yes. And particularly when you are going to do something contentious, like put in a, a full planning application for a 12-bed HMO, uh, you need to make sure that you're ticking all the boxes. Yeah because there'll be a lot of resistance against it. Um, and the council may well try and use anything within their power to say no. So you need to get to a point where they can't say no. No, no yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, it makes complete sense. And I guess then also, if anyone challenges you on anything, you know all the rules, you know all the regulations. You can say, well, this is why I haven't done that. This is why I have done this. Exactly, and it's also, you know, it's changing uh, preconceptions about these places. So when, the planning application for the other HMO went in for the eight bed on, on Osborne Road. Um, there was uproar in the streets, there, there was people, uh, there was someone who was writing letters to all the neighbours asking them to object. We held a neighbour consultation, we heard everyone's um, views on it and then you know we finished the build, it's all been done now and we haven't heard from anyone. Everyone on the street has our number if there's any, and, you know, and we've said if there's any issues or anything like that just give us a call there's been nothing in almost a year. Often it's the perception of it which is worse than actually the reality. Absolutely, and you can just imagine, like if, if you live nearby and that there's any sort of building works going on nearby and you get a letter through your door that says, this is a proposal, we invite you to comment on it or object to it if you want yeah. to. Uh, understandably, people nearby are scared of change and they're worried that you know the house next door is gonna be turned into a slum or something. So yeah. it, again, yeah. it, it's trying to get ahead of that which is what I will do uh, and speak to everyone nearby, hear everyone out, maybe even change the design somewhat if there are any you know, useful suggestions other than, I don't want a building sign next door for nine months and, and blah, 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 that kind of thing. So yeah, just get ahead of the potential objections. Interesting. No, I think it's really good what you're doing on that front and I think really interesting about the policies as well. The other thing I wanted to share is, is if you don't mind talking a little bit on the price of this one. So you yeah. said it came on it. 525. So originally it was advertised, it must have gone on the market a good 18 months, two years ago at 525. Yeah. That price would have put me off initially from even looking, but I can't remember why. I, th I think maybe then it was reduced to 475 or something. It came and had a look, uh, and then it went down to 450 because it had been on the market for quite a while. I put an offer in at 355, which was rejected, uh, and then I followed up every week for about two months, I think, after that until the point where they decided to accept the offer which was great. I was then going to try and buy it with a mortgage. The valuer came out and said, it's not suitable for mortgage purposes because no one can immediately move in, yeah. basically. Yeah. Uh, and that was my uh, original plan, was to sort of rent it out, potentially as is, for a low rent, uh, while I was going through planning. Mm -hmm. uh, so then that, I, I didn't have the financing for it there, so I had to go back to the vendor and say, there are more issues the house that I'd noticed as well and that my financing has fallen through so I'm gonna have to delay when I can buy it to raise the financing in another way and also drop the price as well because there's more issues than I anticipate, anticipated and understandably they, they weren't happy about that and they refused the, the offer and they put it back on the market again and then a couple of months went by and they hadn't had any other interest right because they put it back, back on the market at 400 and then I went back to them and then they accepted my offer of 330 in the end. And I've now, as of right now, exchanged on it with a delayed completion. So I'll be completing at the end of April. So I think it's so impressive. And the main reason I wanted to bring that point up for people watching is to come on at 475 or 450, or sorry, come on at 525. 525 originally. 475, 450. And at that level, you've come in with an offer at 100 grand less, which most people would be too embarrassed to do. And it's that actually that I guess makes a difference, you know, between investors is that sometimes it is embarrassing, but that's where the, the numbers make sense. It's still worth putting in, it's still worth following up. You've got to have that belief, which obviously you have from doing previous projects. And by following up, you've managed to get the deal done, right? 100%. And I, I was embarrassed put, putting the offer in because <laughs> again, even if, they, even if the owner has been misled by the agent. There would have been a reason why they listed it at 525 originally and chances are an agent said, oh yeah, it's a beautiful house, you could probably get 525 for it. But then six months go by and there's no bites. You'd be silly not to go in with an offer that works for you. If you've mm -hmm. got to that point where you've run the numbers and then the number that pops out is slightly embarrassing, yeah. Put your what's the worst on the table. that could happen? Yeah. And yeah, so, and, and I think that the main thing is with that is again, just systemizing it. So it's making sure that 
when I've got offers out every Friday, I'm calling the agent for all my offers. Even if, you know, sometimes six months go by and the agent is sick of me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but then eventually something will happen where uh, someone else is, is buying a property and it's fallen through, you call at the right time and you can kind of step in and, and save the day. Because at that point, the agent doesn't want to relist a house when a sale has just fallen through. That's a pain in their ass. The seller might be in a chain and might need the cash to fund an onwards purchase. Mm -hmm. So it's surprising how often you can find yourself in the right place at the right time if you systemize being in the right place. Yeah. Sometimes it will be the right time. And that Friday that you call up, it's fallen through, whatever whatever the reason, yeah. you're just there and you're ready. And that's the main thing. And are you saying anything weird, wonderful and magical? Or are you just saying, hi, it's me again. Just wanted to check in. That's literally it. Yeah. That's literally it. It's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes I phone, often by email these days. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, you'd be surprised how often you get the email back that says, well, it just so happens. And then, yeah, brilliant. No, I think that's a really valuable lesson for anyone. And uh, what a fantastic project. I can't wait to follow this one through over the next 12, 18 months. Was it totally? Something like that. Yeah. And even if it doesn't go the way that I hope it goes and I don't get through planning or whatever happens to it, it'll be uh, interesting to sort of document it along the way, 100%. see what happens. Because yes. I'm, I'm going to be learning a lot from yes. this as well. Yeah. So. No, brilliant. Well, thank you once again for coming okay. on the channel and for sharing another one of your properties. So we've just arrived. We are in main Liverpool. We are actually in an area called Old Swan or the postcode is L13. This is a good investment area. And we're doing a project on behalf of a client. So come on in and I'm going to show you around. So this is a glorious two bedroom, mid terraced property your standard buy to let property within Liverpool. This was purchased for around £79,000, not around £79,000, it was £79,000 purchase price. And we're basically doing a full refurbishment. In fact, this property prior to our clients buying it hadn't been, hadn't changed hands in almost a hundred years. So the connections to, to gas, to water and to everything was a bit of a nightmare, but the builders have been really helpful on that front and we're making sure that we tackle all of those problems as the refurb's been going on. As we stand in it today, obviously we've gone through quite a lot of work. So we had the full rip out done. We've had uh, obviously the first fix, plumbing and electrics. We've had plastering done and we've had kind of the mist coat done as well. I've actually forgotten to mention we had damp proofing done at the back and the front of the house as well. We've blocked up one doorway, but apart from that, we are not changing the layout at all. Although this property probably would have good potential to change the layout. So at the front, you've got the sitting room. This is kind of like a dining living area. And at the back here, you've got this quite small kitchen. I say quite small, what I mean to say is minuscule kitchen, okay? If you were buying this property and you were flipping it or you were gonna live in it as a home, then you'd probably extend out that way or you'd extend out this way in order to create a bigger kitchen space. You might even move the kitchen into the dining or living space. But our client wants to keep refurb down to a minimum in terms of cost, wants to get the most out of the project in terms of a buy to let, and therefore wanted to just work with this space. What it does mean is we had to be very creative with what we've done in the kitchen. It's actually a really nice kitchen. Uh, this is from DIY Kitchens. Really nice laminate worktops and uh, obviously these kind of wood effect dark units. We've left space um, either side for appliances and on this side we've got our oven, we've got extractor, and um, yeah, I think it's, it's a very, very compact kitchen, but it's a very useful kitchen. And once it's all finished, it look great as well, because they don't often do all dark kitchens, so that's quite a change, a bit of a mix up for us. Right, so we're upstairs now. There could have been a big potential to change the layout here, but again, we didn't. We kept things simple. We're keeping it as a two bedroom mid terrace. We're going for a 130,000 pound end valuation. So bought it for just under 80, pushing that value up and hoping to get about 130,000 on the back end, which I think is very realistic given the size of this property, this area, and it should get a great rent here as well. We don't change much with bathrooms. We go for the standard large gray tiles because they look great and they 
um, obviously aren't too expensive to purchase as well. And this was the old bathroom. We've literally done it in exactly the same layout. So this is coming on really well and expect this, this house, particularly this part of the bathroom to be finished within the next couple of weeks, hopefully. So moving into the second bedroom, this is actually a really good sized bedroom. I think this has the potential to be a, a, you know, a double bedroom still, which is really good. But wait until you see the front bedroom, that's really big. Got a small cupboard here. It's a little bit you know, small, it's quite a shallow cupboard, but it'll be really good for storage. Obviously, could add some shelves in there to really get the most benefit out of it. The main thing I want to talk to you about here is having a brand new boiler on the wall in a bedroom. Because that's not ideal, let's face it. But in this property, we didn't have much option. We can't put it in the bathroom with the layout in there. And we certainly can't put it in the kitchen, as you've seen how small it was down there. So we got together, we had a chat about it. We don't ideally want to put it in the loft, so that's quite hard to access in this property. So therefore the best space that we felt was where it used to be, which is here, but obviously replacing it with a new boiler. And then we'll have a um, built-in cupboard put here as well. So this will actually be housed in a cupboard so it's not technically not within the bedroom, it has some form of cover, but it's still not ideal. This isn't where we would choose to put a boiler, particularly when we're doing a full refurbishment and we are adding a new boiler into a property. But it is what it is, you have to kind of roll with the punches, you have to problem solve on the go with a lot of these projects. This is where we could really have had the uh, potential to potentially change things. And that is because this room is so big. Hopefully you can hear me with the echo, but this room is actually potentially big enough to have put two bedrooms in. And this is something that I had a quick chat with, with Builder, with the client. And again, we kind of came to the conclusion that actually for what we want to do as a BRR buy to let, this is best kept as it is, keeps that refurbishment cost down, means the client can just go after his standard refinance, rent this out to a small family or working professionals, and it still does the cash flow that he initially intended to when buying. But yeah, really big projects coming to a bit of a close in this room. Yeah, lots of stuff's been done here. All we really need to do, don't know why I'm still holding this. What we really need to do, oh, the builder does, is he's put the vent on the other side of that because it's an air boot brick put in. Whilst I'm here, let's talk about the refurb, okay? Because it's small things like putting air bricks and vents in each bedroom that will really help when it comes to someone living here, okay? What are the biggest issues that we face as landlords with these older style properties? Well, we face damp, we face mold, uh, as well as just other general maintenance. But talking on the topics of damp, of course, the main thing that we try to do with damp is we try and tackle it during the refurbishment. We try and make sure that we stay on top of things such as the roof, stay on top of things such as the, the mortar in between the bricks in order to not allow doubt to come back into the property. But when it comes to mold, people often think that mold is, is very closely related to damp, and that's not always true. Really mold is actually more to do with how someone is living within a property and that environment. And normally if they're breathing out lots of hot air and all of the windows are sealed shut and there is no airflow, that's what creates condensation that's what creates um, mold. So therefore what we try to do is we try to install uh, air vents, or should I say vents on the windows. If we're not putting new windows in, we try and add these to the windows and we put an air brick in with a vent within the room. Now, inevitably some tenants will block them up because they don't want the cold air circulating in. As a landlord or having a letting agent, that is something that you have to a range have to deal with. So I thought that'd be an interesting thing just to talk about for a second. So let's talk about the refurb, let's talk about the numbers. I, I told you we bought it for 79, told you it's worth about 130 at the end. So what's the refurb? Well, typically when I started doing refurbishments in Liverpool and, and the areas of the Northwest, a full refurbishment on a property like this in let's say 2019, 2020, was coming in at like between 18 and 20,000. Now we're definitely looking at like 30,000 for majority of these refurbs. Now, some people in the comments can go, wow, that's so high, I can't believe you're paying that much. Some people can go, what, you can't do a refurb for 30,000, that's a lie. And I've had both ends of that. But the, that is the truth. I do these refurbs week in, week out and have been doing them for several years. And in this area, you are looking at just over 30,000 actually 
for this refurbishment. Now, bearing in mind that we are doing, obviously, damp proofing. We are doing a full rewire with a new consumer unit. We are re-plumbing and, and obviously putting a new boiler into the property with new radiators. We're doing full replaster, full redecoration, new kitchen, new bathroom. You name it, it's being done. The only thing that isn't being done here is all new windows, okay? Some of them are new, some of them are obviously having to be replaced. So there is a lot of work being done at this property and that's why you're looking at like 30 uh, or just over 30,000 pounds for a refurbishment like this. So day number two, and I'm standing next to this beautiful Liverpool architecture. No, I'm only joking, but this is the travel lodge. We stayed here last night. I stay here quite regularly. It's got lovely, easy access to a Nando's opposite. And after a busy day, you need to get in a good refeed, which we did last night. Uh, so today our mission is to drop some keys off to a builder. We've got to um, just go and look at outside of a property that I am uh, looking to purchase direct to vendor and then we're heading straight over to Manchester. Manchester! You like Manchester? So Manchester we're going to be meeting Aston who I'll introduce you to shortly but before we do anything I want to talk to you about the Property X sourcing service. Our service has changed quite significantly over the last four to six months we've been putting this into action and now we've kind of fully made this pivot and this transition into being a different sourcing business. Okay, yesterday you'll have seen that refurbishment and that is our last project managed refurbishment. Going forward, we do not do project management. That was taking too much time and effort away from the team and stopped us being allowed to put more time into just finding better deals, building better relationships and bringing the best discounted deals to you as buyers. So now going forward, we have a WhatsApp group, which I'll put a link for in the chat below. If you want to join, if you want to be sent notifications, with our deals, then you just sign up to our email list and you'll get sent an invite to join our WhatsApp group. And off the back of that, we will notify you when we get good potential deals. And these are likely to be BMV, like ready to go buy to lets. They're gonna be BRR type investments. They're gonna be flips where there's some good money to be made as well. And the reason we're doing this is that we've formed some brilliant relationships with cash companies, with traders, and we're now getting sent some brilliant deals means that we can put more time into getting those relationships, those deals, bringing those to you. And what we will do is hand you over to a really good build team. So that there'll still be a quote. There's still gonna be a builder on hand that can help you. And they'll kind of be doing part of that project management service for you. So the full service is still there. It's just slightly changed. Click the link in that description, in the description below this video, because it would be great to work with more of you through our sourcing division. So I told you there'd be more change coming in this video and well, look what's happened. I have joined the Eco Warriors, the electric car crew. I bought myself a Tesla and I'm very proud of it actually. I'm really, really excited. Buy this car. Now I know what you're thinking. First thing's out the way. What have I done with the Punto? That lovely trusted car that's been so reliable all these years on all these trips. Well, don't worry. I have not got rid of it and I will not get rid of it. I'm gonna keep that car forever. It's a perfect DIY run around car and uh, the amount of dump trips I've done in there, well, I probably couldn't sell it on to anyone anyway. So I'm keeping that car, but this is my new daily driver and I'll be doing the trips in this because it's, well, it's down well comfortable and uh, it's, a, it's a really nice car, let's face it. The first thing I've heard is, well, Justin, I thought you were a petrol head. What have you done? You've, you've left us and that is not the case. I do well and truly intend to get another weekend car in the future in which I will, of course, go for your typical car, maybe like a nice two-seater run around or something like that. So I've not left us, but you've got to move with the times and a car like this is, is so great. It's very tax efficient. And, uh, and of course, the comforts of driving long drives like this is, is perfect. And I will do a whole separate video on that as well. Now, the other thing I've heard is, what are you doing buying a brand new car? Shouldn't you buy, be buying more houses? And well, I do agree. I had that very thought even just two weeks before picking up this car. I was thinking, why did I buy a car? I should take every single bit of money and buy every single house that I can. And there are many, what I deem to be, you know, clowns in this industry <laughs> who are, you know, taking any bit of money they earn and spending it on, you know, extravagant cars, watches and, and things they don't really need, whereas they should be reinvesting it back into assets. But I feel there's a balance. There's a balance to enjoying life, 
having good holidays, having nice things and, and working hard and rewarding yourself. And I felt this was the time. So I did it, I took the plunge. I will not be buying anything else extravagant for the short term. I'll be putting everything back into property and making sure I continue to build my portfolio. Switch. Yeah, I'm balling, yeah, I'm balling. Mate, welcome to the channel. It's nice to finally meet you. And uh, we are here in central Manchester. Couldn't yeah. get more central if we tried. No. Uh, would you be able to just show us around this latest project that you've acquired and talk, talk through the numbers and yeah, what the project's yeah, going to be? Yeah, yeah. So we bought a grade two listed building in central Manchester. Uh, M1 Postco, to anyone that knows it, it's in Piccadilly. We purchased it for 750k. Yeah. And I'm going to spend about 400k on it. Expecting start works in about three, four months. Right, yeah. um, got to discharge a few conditions and a few things that we got to do beforehand. But obviously, as you can see, it's pretty much just a derelict building yeah. at the minute. Um, big space, 4,000 square foot. So I guess what we're doing now is the whole building's having big, the new um, like fire alarm system put in, um, smoke system, which is what we need. And this will be the first flap. So from this back wall, pretty much going the whole span across here. Yeah. This is, it's not the biggest flat, but it's got a you know, beautiful view. Yeah. The sun sort Best of comes up over that, that way. So, yeah. Um, yeah, of course, features all windows and things like that. So, yeah, the windows are incredible. And the fact that yeah. you're on the corner gives you so obviously the dual aspect. Yeah. I think there's, is it 40, 45 windows in this place? Wow. Okay. And like that's a cost that a that's lot of people insane. don't account for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much they're going to cost us, but it will it'll be quite a lot. With it being listed, you'll probably have to keep the same style, but just upgrade the, the pane of glass. Yeah, yeah, so they're quite strict with it. So currently at the minute, they've already got secondary glazing off mm -hmm. and they're, you know, lift up and pull down ones. They want us to change all of those, so they're kind of like French doors, oh, even okay. though they've already Right. Got ones on that. Yeah, yeah. And then the current windows need to be refurbished, so you know, sort out the poly system on it, yeah. um, refurbish them, repaint them. Because at the minute, because the building's not been used for so many years, the paint is just stuck to the side, so you can't even open the windows. Right, I believe. And obviously, you yeah. can't then damage the windows or put new. You know, if there's a wood framing, it yeah. has to be exactly the same as that because it's listed. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of stuff you got to take into consideration, I guess. Yeah, I bet, which is how you quickly get to that 400,000 recall oh, cost. Oh, yeah, okay. super, yeah. super quick. Um, so with this, like, um, so you're saying you're having, obviously, the firearm mm -hmm. system put in. Is that, say, your do, or the whole the guy that owns the building is doing? So it's on behalf of the, the management agent. So they are also, you can probably see all the scaffolding outside, yeah. they are cleaning the whole building. Um, I think that's something that the council has asked them to do. Okay. Um, and then obviously with sort of new regulations coming in and I was speaking to you about the height of the building, yeah. with something called Gateway 2, which most people don't know about, and we've only just learned about. There's loads of new fire and smoke strategies that you have to sort of abide by, so. Um, and that's just the back of the Grenfell. Yeah, for Grenfell. Yeah, yeah, so any build, for people that don't know, any building above 80 meters tall, it falls into a new category called Gateway 2. So instead of dealing with your you know, your local council sort of building regs and fire safety, yeah. it's escalated to government level. Um, so to even get any sort of sign off, it's a minimum 12 week process, um, application process. So something that we didn't account for yeah. and it pushes your start day back 12 weeks. Yes. Yeah. Um, and obviously you've got your planning conditions that you can do in the meantime. Yeah. But obviously part of your planning conditions are to do with the fire safety. So it's, it's a... Chicken neck. Timing that you can, <laughs> I guess, account for it is, is probably the lesson on it. I'll, I'll yeah, 100%. Here. I think, you know, we're young, we're learning. Most of the things we do, we've learned on the job. Yeah. Made loads of mistakes. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's just one of those. We spoke to some developer friends that we've got, and it's something they wouldn't have picked up. Yes. And it's just, now we know, you know, you can tell other people about it, and other people won't make the same mistake, and we won't make the same mistake again, so. That's the main thing, yeah, I think, if there's a lesson to take from it, that's great. It's yeah, 100%. Great. So you've got one flat at the front. Yeah, and then the second flat starts here. So this actually used to be an old bank, so the bank used to be downstairs. Right. This used to be the office. So oh. we've actually got this safe here, which I don't know what it's made out of, but there's just no way. That's just Someone's a solid up. block. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's no chance of getting into that. Is I it? have no clue how we're going to get that out of the building. Um, but yeah, this used to be the floor where sort of yes. the office was. So you've got the second flat that runs 
pretty much the rest of the sport. And these flats, are they likely to be like one, one beds with like an open plan kitchen? Yes, yeah, so they are one three bed and three two beds. Oh, right. It's so okay. a big flat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some of the flats are a thousand square foot. Wow, okay. Uh, I think it's because the space is open, you can't visualize it. Whereas, exactly, yeah. yeah and it's quite a simple layout, to be fair. From the front door, you've got a corridor coming the whole way down here. Yep. And the flats are kind of that way. Yes. There's one flat, two flat. And then we do have consent to actually take a little bit of the, the wall out here to make a doorway. Okay. Um, that's the only sort of structural thing that they're doing within the site, which is pretty good. Um, and that then just joins the two together. Fine. Um, so I guess was it relatively easy for architects to draw the plans? It is, but one problem we have had is the ventilation and drainage. Right. And you'll always have this on listed buildings because you can't vent out the walls. So yeah. we can't, you know, core a hole outside right. because it's a listed building. Yeah, I didn't think about so that. So for drainage, you also have to tap into the existing drainage. So we have to get the full drainage plan for the building and the architect designs flats based on where the drainage is. Because if he puts a bathroom over there and the only drainage pipe is over there, then the floor not going to be up here <laughs> to, get, <laughs> yeah. to get the drop. Okay. Um, so yeah, again, like that's me yeah, thinking actually it's probably really easy to draw, you know, because it's yeah. the same layout, but actually it's not when you think about other things like that. No, and you know, these are just things we learn along the way. Yeah. And like when you do bigger size, you get bigger problems and more things that you're going to learn on it, but just yeah. take one to your next spot. Yeah. So um, just because I don't know if we have mentioned this, this mm -hmm. is all, all one floor. Yeah. Of, uh, how many stories is it total? Four, four five. five. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Some dormers on the top as well. And it's about 4,000 4, square, square foot. Yeah, it's yeah, huge. Yeah. It's huge, isn't it? This space here is going to be like the bin store and the bike store. So we're splitting off here. With the, the bin store, bike store, obviously bin store, yeah. Uh, bike store, is that something as a nice to have or do you have to have it as Had part of planning? Had to have it as part of planning. Yeah. Thought There's point. so many things that you've got to have as yeah. part of planning. That's where the doorways will be created. Okay. You sort of see how old the building is like. That whole page has probably been there for, yeah, I've trailed how long, 100 years maybe. This half of it almost doesn't feel like the top of the back. It feels like, like an old pub or a bar. Yeah, yeah, it's dark, isn't it? It's like all this, yeah, and the way they've done the radiators. Yeah, and there's some beautiful radiators. Yeah. And you can see all like, the old electrics over there. Really nice space, you want to keep as much as the sort of natural features as we possibly can. Yeah. Uh, Manchester at the end of the day, we want to make it, you know, we're two minutes from the Northern Quarter. Yeah. Um, maybe expose brick, um, maybe keep some old rats. So here's going to be three, flats three and four. Yeah, so flat three, obviously we're knocking through that wall. Yeah. There's a little bit of that room. Yep. And up to here in this room. Yep. And then the fourth flat, which I think yeah, it's a two bed. It's from here, the wraps away, all around the corner. Fine. And there's this like stairwell here? Yeah, there's... so there's, again, which is a positive because of gateway two, you need two exits from the building. Yeah. And luckily, we have two entry and exits. And that bit of the front, that bit of the Yeah, so this is the fire exit. And I don't know if you actually want to look at this. But again, this will be the sort of place where the works will come in. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, big, really good. Yeah, and I'll straight down to the back, off. to the back, um, back road. Which is cool. You can sort of skip there as well. And have good access. Yeah, that is ideal, isn't it? Really. It's also central Manchester to put a skip somewhere or access for the builders. I know with most of your projects, which we we'll talk about when we do, you know, sit down in a minute, you've purchased them, you've refurbished them, you've refinanced them, or and then you sell them on as yeah. well. With the exit, this is straight sell, you know, obviously renovation and sell them. Yeah, yeah. just straight. Uh, the way we finance this is a JV for a wealth manager. So they raise the cash uh, through their clients. Um, we set up a limited company together, 50-50, yep. we split the profits down the middle. They bring the cash, or they bring the exit as yep. well. And we find the site, do the development, make sure everything's prepped, compliant, and we essentially will give them the site and they will sell it and split the profit. Oh, great. So you can kind of, once it's done, you're kind of almost a little bit hands-off. Yeah, 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 literally. Yeah. We, we will try and sell some of the units ourselves yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, Um Through people that we know or, or the agents, but yeah, we, we've we all kind of got our own sort of individual roles, which is good. Yeah, makes complete sense. So, um, and is, is that kind of where you're going with the business now? Is you wanting to do more this kind of thing or are you doing your bread and butter still? 
I think, and, and we, we fell into this trap of seeing people do bigger sites and thinking, I want to do the bigger sites. Mm -hmm. Big, shiny sort of buildings in Manchester or big commercial to resi conversions, I think. We want to get this one done and finished. We've done three now. Um, they're a lot harder. Things go wrong, and then when things go wrong, your finance costs are just accruing and accruing and accruing. Yes. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot more risk on your head. So we do like sticking to our terrace houses, semis, yeah. and whether it's a flip, a HMO, buy to let, whether we're selling them, refinancing them, and then the commercial to resi stuff will always be sort of so. So yeah, yeah. yeah. But I guess the smaller stuff is more predictable, is what you're saying. Yeah, just so you know what you're doing because you've got so much experience in it. Yeah, we, we always call it like the long tail, which is probably a weird way of putting it, but a lot of people sort of forget about the, the simple stuff at the start. Yeah. Whereas if you put super, super focus onto that, yes. you'll actually make as much, if not more money, as doing a project like this. Yes. Um, and you can do more of that than this. They might take six months to do, yeah. this might take two years to do. Yeah, exactly. So it's like um, what they say, it's horizontal scaling mm -hmm. or vertical scaling. Exactly right? that. So yeah, if yeah. you actually choose one path, I guess if you double down on the horizontal scaling, mm -hmm. eventually you'd have a similar outcome. You just do 100%. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. So, cool. Well, I thank you very much for letting oh, us take a look around. And um, you never know, hopefully, if I'm doing a trip when it's coming towards a close. Yeah, but, uh, hopefully you'll coffee. see the, uh, the end product. Yeah, that'd be fast. Yeah. Oh, oh, thanks very much. I appreciate it. So we have just arrived back in Sussex actually we're not too far from home right now and um, before I depart with Alex I wanted to share some wisdom on the camera hopefully because the theme of this vlog has, has really been about change because we've had to change the sourcing business change to a nice new car and lots is going on in in my business and hiring new staff I've also uh, continuing to grow my portfolio I've literally within the last couple of weeks agreed to buy two new properties for my portfolio so that's two more future uh, properties that I can share with you guys here but in terms of change uh, I think this is something that maybe is mentioned but maybe the point isn't driven home enough and that is that people are really scared to actually make a change whether it's because of judgment from friends judgment from family whoever it is people are really scared of it and in actual fact when we do make a change and then someone comes along and they say something like oh you've changed so much or well why are you doing that why not do what you used to do quite often these are things or, or sayings or comments that I say that are thrown around by people that are actually potentially jealous because they're seeing you make that change, do something different. And they might not even know that they're doing it, but the reality is, is that the reason they are doing it is because they are jealous that you are doing something different and they've not been able to do it. They've not been able to get out of their comfort zone. They've not been able to make that decision in their own mind. And I actually made some notes off the back of this the other night when I was thinking about it. I was like, I've got to make some notes off of this in the hope that I can get through to someone that's watching this, wants to make that big change, wants to get a lot of success, but maybe is, is fearful of doing so. So really the notes that I've made are that something that I've learned from spending time around successful people and from paying for advice so that I can grow my own business and my own portfolio faster is that change doesn't always happen as a just as a, as a result of doing more things in fact sometimes we have to we have to actually actively force change you can't just go along your current life and maybe do a little bit more and, and hope that something's going to happen and then it'll change you actually have to force change and what I mean by that is you have to become a new person in order to get the result that you want. You have to become that person that you want to be. So if you're sitting there today and you're like, well, right now, um, I, you know, I work and uh, I'm not getting enough holiday. I've not got enough control over my life. I don't have any income coming in from property. And yet you want to be the person that's quit their job, working full time in property, has full control, has money coming in from a portfolio, you need to start to think about how would that person live their life? Because you've got to become that person. If you if you don't make some kind of change, what, what do you think is gonna happen? If I was sitting here and I was brand new and I wanted to therefore quickly as possible 
become a property investor with a large portfolio, then I need to take some actions that a successful property investor would be taking. What are some of those actions? Well, quite simply, it's viewing properties consistently, like five to 10 a week, not, not like one or two viewings a month. Okay, one or two viewings a month isn't gonna get a result. So viewing loads of properties, constantly working with agents, making offers and doing follow-ups every single week. In this video, I went and saw my friend Ollie. And one reason that he told me that he's managed to get great deals is because every Friday, he just religiously calls or emails state agents. Obviously networking, you've got to build that network. In fact, you've got to build a network of new people, people that want to become like you and perhaps leave some of those old people behind. And then always be looking to increase your capital pot whether that's through deal sourcing, whether that's through um, doing flips to raise money, whether that is through raising finance from other investors. Always be looking to raise finance, otherwise you're gonna be capped. And that's how I'd do it as a property investor. You know, if I wanted to be a highly successful business owner, I would take that same approach, okay? If I wanted to be someone that had a business with lots of staff, then guess what? Well, I'm going to be reinvesting every single bit of profit that I make back into my business. I need to get over the fear of being on camera, promoting my business. I need to get over the fear of hiring people, which can be really difficult and be, can be expensive. And I need to be relentlessly structured, hungry for growth and level out my emotions if I want that growth. So just as I'm doing with my property portfolio, I'm thinking about what does the future me look like? I'm gonna try and become that person now. I'm doing that in business as well. You know, I really have fear over hiring people. I have a few staff members now and I, I fear that I'm not the best person to manage people, but I can either continue to fear that or I can change that. I can look at what, what do people with good leadership qualities have? What do people that hire people and have big businesses have? How do I become that person now? What, what change do I need to make? So I hope in this ramble, you can take some value from that and you can think about what you need to change in order to get this big outcome that you're looking for and not fear being a different person. You need to be a different person if you want to live the life that you want to live, that kind of dream life that you sometimes think about here. Apart from that, I appreciate you uh, very much watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've got uh, lots of value and I look forward to seeing you in many more future vlogs just like this one. Thanks again. I'll see you next week.